Welcome to St. Matthew's. This is the service for our April 28th. We begin with the opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we confess, if we claim to be without sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess, confess our, our sins, sins God, God is faithful and, and just, just, and, and will, will forgive us our, our sins, sins, and purify us from, from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, God gracious, gracious Father, Father, I am sinful, sinful by nature and have sinned, sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have, I have not loved you with my whole heart. heart. I have, I have not, not loved, loved others, others as I should. I, should. I, I deserve, deserve your punishment, punishment both, both now, now and forever. But Jesus, Jesus my, my Savior, Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent, innocent suffering and death. death. Trusting, Trusting in him, I pray. I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <clears throat> Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, 
Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading com comes from Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. All the believers were in one heart and mind, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. 
For from, the time, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with Psalm 63. Our second reading comes from 1 John 3, verses 18 to 24. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of Jesus, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love another as he commanded us. This one who keeps God's command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to acclaim the gospel. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. 
while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, God, in God, the Father, the Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe, believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son our Lord, Lord, who was, was conceived, conceived by the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and, and was buried. He, he descended into hell. The third the day he rose again, again from the dead. He, he ascended, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with hymn 766.
our sermon text for today comes from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. I think when I was in middle school, the most anxious part of the day was lunchtime. It had nothing to do with eating, but picking which lunch table to sit at. It just made my stomach turn. All the stress and insecurity of who likes me and who doesn't bubbles up all at once. With middle schoolers, there's so much to worry about. Do they like my clothes? Do they think I smell bad? Will I be taking someone else's spot? Do they even want me to sit by them? Although these things sound childish, it can be very real experience for new people trying out a new church. But in the case of churchgoers, we can thank God that it isn't middle schoolers who get to pick who sits at the table, but it's Jesus. And it's the same Jesus who reveals himself in Matthew 15, who gets to pick who sits at his table. Not by what's on the outside, but by what he put inside. Looking at our text, nowhere does it say that Jesus was on a mission to seek out and find dinner guests in Tyre and Sidon. In Mark's account of the same event, he explicitly says that Jesus wanted to avoid being noticed. This account comes from a time in Jesus' life when he was trying to get away. After hearing about the death of John the Baptist, he just wanted some time alone to grieve with his disciples. But the first time they went out, the crowds followed them, and by the thousand and he didn't hesitate to feed them with his mercy. He healed their sick and literally fed all 5,000 of them with one little plate of food. And then after walking across the sea that night, they found him on the other side, again by the thousands. And this time he didn't hesitate to feed them with his mercy. He healed their sick and went toe to toe with the Pharisees among them. The Pharisees claimed that it was their external rituals that kept them clean but Jesus showed that it was their internal behaviors that made them unclean. And after all this, Jesus still hadn't had the time to rest with his disciples. So in our account for today, again, he tries to get away. But this time, it's not crowds that find him. Just one single woman come to beg. There are four things we see about her right, right away two external things and two internal things. The first thing we see is that she's a Canaanite. The Canaanites are one of the most obvious other groups in the Bible. We see them the most during the Exodus, when Moses was leading God's people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. See, the Canaanites were violent, immoral, and idolatrous, and they were hostile to God and his people. But most importantly, they lived in the land that God had promised to his Israelites. And God also said that the Israelites would have to remove the Canaanites by force. And they did so. This woman is the only Canaanite we see in the New Testament, so we can't say for sure how much that hostility remained. But we can definitely say that when the disciples saw her, they right away saw someone who would be outside of God's chosen people. The second thing we see about this woman is that she's a woman. We don't want to read too much into it, but 
we can say that this is another external factor that immediately in the disciples' eyes makes her different. And if Jesus perceived his ministry for women as different from his ministry for men, this could be a great place to make that obvious. The two internal things are revealed in what she says. First, she has a need, and second, she is passionately looking for help. This woman is deeply afflicted, having to stand helplessly and watch her daughter be tormented by a demon. And she knows there's no earthly cure for demon possession, but she also knows where to find this unearthly help. Lord, have mercy on me, she says. This is the, the same refrain we still use today in worship. She even goes so far as to call him the son of David. This Old Testament name for the Messiah shows us that this is exactly the kind of faith that Isaiah would have prophesied. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. In just one sentence, this woman powerfully declares who God is and she confesses that she needs God's help. These four things color the way that we hear what that we hear how the disciples and Jesus respond to her. We have four responses that honestly could put us in a tailspin if we take them out of context. Take Jesus' first reaction. Not even one word. It just hits our hearts and we, we want to yell, Jesus, what are you doing? How could you just ignore her? Some people even want to twist this reaction to dismantle Jesus' perfection, saying he's racist or sexist, saying he turned a blind eye to a Canaanite woman. But that kind of interpretation throws out the internals to focus on the externals. Jesus is neither dumbstruck nor hateful. When he saw her, he knew her, and he knew everything he could possibly know about her. Before he hung the stars in the heaven, he knew exactly how great a faith the Holy Spirit would give this woman. No, he's not ignoring her, but he is masterfully guiding the situation. Jesus closes his mouth and lets someone else speak, so this conversation will end up where he wants it to. But before we hear from the woman again, the disciples interject. They don't seem to care to see what Jesus has already seen in this woman. Come on, Jesus, just get this over with. This lady's being too loud. They are annoyed by this foreign woman who is interrupting their getaway. They make it clear from their response that it doesn't matter to them if Jesus heals her daughter. They just want their peace and quiet back. But Jesus doesn't let them go on with this, and he takes back the conversation with another dizzying quote. I was not sent if not for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It sounds odd, but if we look at how the disciples could have responded, it becomes clearer. They should have said, why now, Jesus? Yeah, being the Messiah is a pretty Jewish thing, but no one has been checking papers with all these crowds. A couple foreigners could have slipped in. And the Roman centurion in Capernaum, he definitely wasn't an Israelite. But you healed his servant, and you said his faith was greater than anyone in Israel. <clears throat> Jesus really just wanted his disciples to see what he saw in this woman. But sadly, we don't get to hear what the disciples said, if anything at all. We could also imagine what is ringing in their heads in this silence. We can imagine them turning up their noses and thinking, yeah, Jesus, you do only need to come for the Jews, so let's hurry up and get this vacation back to a vacation. And then how easy is it for us to look back 2,000 years and turn up our noses even higher and say to the disciples, how could you be so ignorant? Did you not hear what she said? But that posture looks very hypocritical when we're doing the exact same thing. These days, we claim we don't separate people by gender or ancestry, but how easy is it to look at people on the outside and and divide them between the people I like and everybody else. Sometimes we might even feel like we're in Jesus group, like it's an exclusive club, exclusive club we deserve. But we don't. 
if we apply Jesus' words literally, we aren't even wandering Israelites who need a little more guidance, but we were corrupted sinners from the fallen line of Adam, constantly rebelling against God and building up for ourselves nothing but more pain and damnation. And this is what we were, rotten, inside and out, when Christ saw us. But seeing us, he knew us. And knowing us completely, he stepped away from his heavenly glory and humbled himself to become a man like us. He took on the punishment we deserved, and he won for us victory over ourselves. And as part of this victory, the Holy Spirit sought us out through word and sacrament and filled us with the faith needed to receive his victory. And because of this, the way we live changes. Now we can do more than just hurt ourselves. We can truly love ourselves because God, our Father and Creator, loves us. And this isn't just the me to myself kind of love, but we can love outwardly. We can see all around us others who God has picked up out of the dust and clothed with his own righteousness. It is through the grace of God we can come together to praise and serve him as a united church, not seeing each other by their human exteriors, but dearly loved children of God, filled up with his love. So we have no reason to look at the disciples with our noses turned up, pointing a long finger and saying, you really messed this one. If we do that, we are also guilty of ignoring what Jesus did for the disciples. The ignorance we see here is one of the sins he died for. Just like all of our sinful ignorance, it is completely paid for on the cross. But Jesus isn't just using the situation to show us a negative example, like the disciples getting caught up with the exterior, but he shows us why this woman has a seat at his table, and it's that great faith within her. When Jesus tells the disciples that he wasn't sent for the Jews, or that he was sent only for the Jews, this woman was probably still within earshot. But she doesn't turn tail and wander off. She begs even harder. Falling to her knees, she yells, Lord, help me. She is humble. She puts herself on the ground in the face of her God in the way that only a God-given faith could. And this sheds light on Jesus' next statement. He sees her. She is so passionately revealing this faith inside of her, it would be impossible to take Jesus' next statement as hateful in any way. He says, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. If we're too focused on what we see on the outside of this woman, it can be really easy for this statement to be concerning. But when we let Jesus show us what's on the inside, it, it can't be any, any of the things people say it is. It can't be an insult. It can't be a slur. Jesus definitely isn't doing any of those things. There's no way Jesus is calling her a dog because she's an Israelite. We can be confident in this because we know how Jesus sees people. Jesus sees what's inside this woman that she is blessed with an amazing faith. And he wants her to finish his sentence for him and show the whole world the great faith she has. And she does just that. Yes, Lord, it is right that you should not take the bread away from your children and throw it to me. But I don't need a whole meal. One crumb of your majestic power is enough to soothe the terrible torment of my daughter. And Jesus gave her exactly what she asked for. And he verbally confirms for every reader the greatness of her faith. And note, he doesn't say, your faith is great for a girl, but he only acknowledges her faith. It is this faith, faith that supersedes any other external trait, is why he gives her that crumb and why he gives her a seat at the table so that she may live in his love. And for this same reason, you too have a seat at the table. When God looked at you, there was, there was no shiny exterior that caught his eye. Drowning in your own shortcomings, you used to be completely worthless. 
but in an unthinkable outpouring of love, he sought you out, totally cleansed you from your sin, and filled you with his grace so that you might become the most valuable treasure in the universe, a dearly loved child of God. Because nothing we could affect in ourselves, we get to join God's family and live endlessly, bathed in his mercy. So what would we see if a Canaanite woman walked in this church today? Or for that matter, what do we see when any outsider comes in to beg for God's mercy? We can look past how they walk or how they talk. We don't see their clothes, but their confession. We don't see the kids shuddering in the cafeteria, but we see all believers for who they are, members of God's family, our brothers and sisters, completely clothed in his righteousness. And we want to offer them a seat at the table because this is what Christ did for us. Amen. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and may his face shine on us. Amen. We stand to pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant, Plant your, your word in our, our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love towards all may increase. Support all who spread, spread the, the light, light of, of your, your truth, truth throughout, throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise, Raise up Christians, Christians to serve, serve you in the ministry, ministry of, the of the word and in all godly, godly walks, walks of life. life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give, Give them, them wisdom, wisdom that, that they, they may promote, promote justice, justice and hinder, hinder evil. evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvesting, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant, Grant them, them your, your love, love and take, take them, them into, into your, your tender care. care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in Lord heaven, heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Jesus is risen and we shall arise. Give God the glory, alleluia. Walking the way, Christ in the center, telling the story to open our eyes. Breaking our bread, giving us glory. Jesus, our blessing, our constant surprise. Jesus is risen and we shall arise. Give God the glory, alleluia. Jesus the vine, we are the branches, life in the spirit, the fruit of the tree. Heaven to earth, Christ to the people, gift of the future now flowing to me. Jesus is risen and we shall arise. Give God the glory, alleluia. Weeping be gone, sorrow be silent. Death put asunder and Easter is bright. Cherubim sing, O grave be open. Clothe us in wonder, adorn us in light. Jesus is risen and we shall arise. Give God the glory, alleluia. City Thank you all for joining us this week. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.